So we're really excited to welcome you to our first event of Food and Biodiversity Week 2023. Um, it's especially um, nice to celebrate with you during the Greensfield's 25th anniversary. And um, so this week is all about um, celebrating the work of uh, schools on the food and biodiversity theme and all the different areas that that covers. Um, so today we're really pleased to have Aidan Ring from Fairtrade Ireland um, with us to talk about some uh, really interesting things about the effects of our diet on a more global scale. And um, so Aidan is going to do a, a presentation with us um, for the next um, little while. And um, if you do have questions, um, you can pop them into the, the chat box and we will have time um, at the end to go through some of those. Um, but do please keep your microphone muted um, throughout and as I said, we will have a look at anything you have asked in that um, chat at the end. So get your thinking hats on for any questions you have for Aidan. Um, okay, so I am going to stop sharing my screen now and hand you over um, to, to Aidan. Hi guys. How are you? I hope you're having a lovely Tuesday. I'm just going to share my screen here. And crack on. So, whoops. How's that sound coming through there, uh, Slayer? That's perfect, Aiden. Yeah, and I get your presentation up. Perfect. Okay. Okay, guys. Um, Great stuff. <laughs> nice to be able to see a few of you. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank Antashka uh, for the opportunity to come and speak to you guys today. It's lovely to be here for Ireland's National Biodiversity Week of 2023. Hello. I see some people waving there. So, um, uh, excuse me, excuse me, you there, you, you down the back, you there. Yeah, you, yeah, oh man, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so a little bit about myself, a little bit about my background. So, this is me, um, I'm the Fair Trade Island Communities Outreach Officer. So, that means that my job is to do lots of stuff like this talks, workshops, uh, getting out and about into the communities, rallying the troops, and spreading the message of Fair Trade. This is great, and it's really cool as well to be talking to some schools because um, I was actually introduced to fair trade in school. Uh, so some of you might already be familiar with it, but yeah, when I was in school, I had a teacher. I think I was maybe 12 or 13 at the time. Um, and uh, one teacher was just really passionate about uh, fair trade and uh, global justice. So we had a fair trade lunch. And it was delicious and it was tasty. And here I am, like 15 years later, being the Fair Trade Ireland Communities Outreach Officer, which is just mad. So there you go. You just never know. You do a project like this, guys, you do some uh, vegetable growing, planting, you never know where you're going to end up, you know? So that would be my, yeah, uh, that would just be my little story. Um, and then also, uh, yeah, just some, some questions to be thinking of throughout this presentation. Uh, there's actually two questions. This is one of them. Um, and I'm sure you're already thinking about this. So, you know, if I was in the room with you, I would ask, who here knows what chocolate is actually made of? And do we know where it comes from? And do we know how it gets here? And all of these things. And these are the sorts of things that I, you know, I'm really interested in and was... You know, I was never thinking about this before, you know, I know a little bit more now, but, you know, do any of us actually know? Because previous generations, you would have just grown all your food, you know, the only food you would have had would be stuff that you grown yourself. So, you know, in these days, I think we're a bit disconnected from our food. So, and this is really cool to be kind of, you know, doing a project like this that you guys are doing for National Biodiversity Week. So, and another thing, another question is, you know, like Claire was saying, I've always found it that when I was in school, a great way to pay attention when you were like, you know, in a talk was to try to think of questions because that means that you're looking for gaps that you want to know more about. You're engaging a little bit more deeply. So it's a great way to kind of stay 
focus. That would be my advice. Just <laughs> entirely, you know, objective free piece of advice there. Here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the, um, yeah, a little video explaining fair trade. You'll be pleased to know. Uh, some of you might already know about it, but uh, I think this is a very good overview. Uh, the reality of the climate crisis. Uh, I'm going to cover some of your topics, um, not all of them, but most of them, I think. Uh, so we're going to talk about diets, rainforest and climate, agroforestry and biodiversity, pesticides and pollinators, the future of food, who's your farmer, a case study, and then what can you do at the end in relation to fair trade. So yeah, let's crack on with a little video, get that in there. By the way, this is a good video. I think it's just a good overview. It means fair for people and planet. It means a fair deal for farmers and workers on the front line of the climate crisis to help them deal with the huge challenges climate change is already causing them. Challenges like less fertile land, failing harvests and more extreme weather. It means our eco-friendly fair trade standards. And it means expert advice on sustainable farming techniques from our fair trade producer networks who offer support all around the world. But why does fair trade care about the climate crisis? Because the climate crisis isn't fair. Farmers like Sidi and his family contribute least to this crisis. Carbon emissions per person in the UK are 28 times bigger than those of someone in Sierra Leone, but they are the ones getting hit the hardest. And unless we take urgent action, things will get worse for hard-pressed communities around the world and for the future of our favourite products. Up to 50% of land used for coffee could be unusable by 2050. Plant diseases are becoming more common. Cocoa trees will be harder to grow in West Africa. Wine production could reduce by 40 to 50% in South Africa and Chile. But we can choose a better future with fair trade. Fair trade exists precisely to help those in need get through a crisis and win justice in the longer term. Whether that's a trade crisis of unsustainable prices, the COVID-19 crisis, or the huge challenge of the climate crisis. So how is fair trade helping tackle the climate crisis? When you buy fair trade, it means farmers and workers getting at least a guaranteed fair trade minimum price and an extra payment known as the fair trade premium which they choose how to invest in their communities and farms. That means more resources to deal with the escalating challenges climate change brings. This could mean planting new trees, new climate smart farming techniques, or coping with more extreme weather patterns. Sadly, too many farmers and workers simply don't earn enough to do any of this, which is why our global fair trade movement is campaigning for all farmers and workers to earn a living income, so communities, businesses and families in the global south can survive this crisis. But with our fair trade producer networks, fair trade is there on the ground too, giving expert practical advice. Fair trade farmers are on the front line of the climate crisis, but are working to win a better future for our planet. They work in line with our eco-friendly fair trade standards, bans on deforestation, commitments to reduce carbon footprints, protections for biodiversity. So every time you choose fair trade, you're choosing a better future for all of us and the whole planet. Action on climate change is in our hands. Share to help us win a fairer future. So, there you go. That's um, a little bit about the, uh, the situation that we're facing and what fair trade is doing to combat the climate crisis and the loss of biodiversity. So, yeah, that's one thing to mention is that the, the reality of the climate crisis is pretty tough, um, but it also does have a lot of overlap with biodiversity. The biodiversity uh, loss that we're seeing, uh, species going extinct and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's kind of just a thing to uh, have in your mind when you're thinking about these uh, types of things. And the thing is that it's um, it's tough for us, you know, in the global north, but it's even tougher in the global south, as we were seeing in that video. So this is th these are just like some some of the facts. So, um, you know, for instance, um, you know, as the video was saying, it's not fair. So the poorest half of the global population are responsible for only 10% of global emissions. Um, and 
50% of our emissions are attributed to the richest 10%. Put another way, that means that the, the richest 1% in the world produce twice as many emissions as the world's poorest 50% of people. Twice as much. That is just nuts. And this goes back in time, like very far back in time as well. And it's really like the, the, the problem is the disconnection between us and nature, the disconnection between us and our food and other wildlife. Um, and that really began with the Industrial Revolution. Um, so it's only like we're only seeing the worst effects of it now, but it's a whole inequality thing and unfairness, a problem with unfairness and lack of equality across the world, because most of the, a lot of the wealth of the global north has been taken, extracted from the global south in the form of, you know, crops or gold, cotton, um, textiles, whatever it is. And uh, so that is not fair. So that's, you know, why I think the whole, the fair aspect of fair trade is so important uh, and to kind of you know bring that into the topic of diets rainforests and climate um you can kind of see here in the picture on the right this is farmers in the dominican republic um that's some banana crops that have been ruined the dominican republic is in africa so the places hardest hit by climate change are some of the world's most biodiverse reasons re regions so this is this is a big problem because that's where you got the climate crisis and biodiversity intersecting. Because they're also where a lot of our food comes from. So, you know, Central America, East Africa and the Caribbean, like lots of coffee, tea, sugar, vegetables, coconuts, avocados, all of these things that we love. Um, they A lot of them come from the uh, places around the equator that are the most biodiverse, biodiverse reasons, <laughs> regions on earth um, and in terms of uh, rainforests and deforestation why does deforestation occur um, so these are just some reasons it occurs for timber to take wood to make our tables uh, to clear land for beef farming for lots and lots of cows and to create plantations of palm oil I think some of you were covering this in your topic. So palm oil is, you know, basically it's a, it's an oil that actually is in a huge amount of products that we don't even know about, like nuts and yogurts and uh, just many, many things contain palm oil. So uh, the industry and a lot of forests are cut down uh, to make it. Um, so this is kind of a visual representation of that. So how this impacts biodiversity and the uh, climate is that the deforested land on the left there has only a tiny fraction of biodiversity of the original forest. Um, and it goes from absorb absorbing carbon to emitting it. So, you know, trees breathe in carbon dioxide and then uh, exhale oxygen. Uh, whereas when they're cut down, they release all that carbon into the atmosphere. So it becomes a carbon emitter, we call it. Um, and then deforestation apparently over throughout the entire world causes 20% of all of our greenhouse gas emissions, which is a huge amount. Um, so we just need to plant more trees and grow more forests. And the forests we do have, we need to leave them alone. So what's Fair Trade doing? So our projects that we have with communities in the Global South um, plant a lot of trees. So agroforestry is one thing which means that trees are deliberately planted alongside crops and animals uh, to improve nutrient and water cycling and to keep the soil healthy and stop it getting, stop this soil from getting eroded away and increasing biodiversity. So lots of animals. So fair trade standards don't allow the cutting down of forests with high conservation value. So, you know, if, if the trees are small and spread out and there isn't a lot of biodiversity or if, there is, uh, if they're diseased or something, it's fine to cut them down. Uh, but if there's if it's a national park or it's a biodiversity hotspot, they can't be cut down. We need to protect them. Um, so that's uh, that's one thing that fair trade premiums go towards uh, some cool projects. Um, so you know brings us on to the topic of Irish biodiversity where we're at. Um, because don't forget, we once had a rainforest ourselves. Ireland used to be covered in forests like the ones you see on the right, North Atlantic temperate rainforest, it was called. 70 to 80% of Ireland was covered in trees. Um, but now it's mostly farmland, which uh, is just, um, so we've already kind of cut down a lot of our forests. But um, 
it's largely with our farming model. So once that farming model changes, you know, we use less pesticides, we don't cut down hedgerows, and we prioritize wildlife and biodiversity, uh, then, you know, it, it could come back very quickly. So we're lucky because our climate uh, is very mild and temperate, and we're unlikely to be hit with, you know, huge climate uh, disasters like, like other countries. So that means we could be world leaders in terms of regenerating biodiversity. And there are many, many communities of people around Ireland working to enhance biodiversity. So one of my other big things that I do is I'm involved in a lot of tree planting campaigns with native trees. So uh, oak, big, massive oak trees, gnarly thickets of holly and blackthorn and, you know, beech trees the size of a church. There's some, some fragments of that left, and we'd like to see that, you know, for future generations. And uh, hey, you guys are doing it, so fair play. Um, to talk a little bit about uh, wildlife further, um, pesticides, wildlife, and protecting pollinators. So our food system globally and in Ireland use a lot of pesticides. So that is chemicals sprayed on the plants to prevent insects and birds from eating them. Um, they're useful because they stop crops from being eaten so we can grow, grow more food, but they are bad because they end up in our food. So we eat the pesticides. They harm farmers a lot. Uh, they poison the soil and wildlife. And they're bad for pollinators. So you can see the bumblebee there on the right. It's covered in pollen. Um, but bee isn't going to go near a field or an area that has a lot of pesticides in the air. So that means that, you know, you're solving the problem for this one crop. It's not going to get eaten by insects. But, you know, for other crops down the line, you know, the next year's crop or the next year after that, you know, there's going to be fewer pollinators. So there's going to be fewer crops. So there's going to be... Um, you're going to have a shortage and you're going to have to use more uh, for artificial fertilizer and stuff like that. So it's just compounding the problem. So I think some of you guys are covering that. So what does fair trade do? We use fewer pesticides and we go for natural fertilizers wherever it's possible. Um, so we recommend the use of an integrated pest management thing, which is the selection of appropriate varieties, cultivation, methodology, and organic pest control. So that's like planting the right plants in the right places and that kind of thing. Um, and the upshot of that is that we have uh, fair trade roses. Um, we're going into the rose market and fair trade roses produced in Kenya. You can see there on the left, uh, use 70% less insecticides and fungicides than average Kenyan roses. So imagine how much healthier those plants are. And that's just roses. Imagine how much healthier your food is if it doesn't have all of those poisonous chemicals sprayed on it. So that's a big thing about fair trade is organic, organic and sustainable practices. So brings us on to the future of food. So this is a, a mural. I'm going to tell you a bit about fair trade Fortnite in a sec. But basically, this mural is one we had commissioned in Dublin, South William Street, if anybody's in Dublin, if anybody saw it. Um, so it's an astronaut holding some bananas, you can see there the empty shelves, the whole idea being that by 2050, if we don't do much, if we don't do enough to um, change our farming models, change the chemicals we use, you know, change our expectations of food, you know, like we expect to have all food at all time of the year, you know, but it just, that's very against the natural seasonal cycles, you know, seasonal food and seasonal crops. And um, so if we don't change all of this, we could have no coffee and chocolate and bananas. These are things might all be in very short supply in the future. Um, and so this is Daniel, who is a farmer from Honduras, who came to visit Dublin for both or being uh, the crops. Um, so um, uh, the could be so coffee is one. You probably don't all drink coffee uh, at this stage, but um, uh, by 2050, up to half the land currently used to farm coffee may be unusable. So that's, you know, does that mean the price of coffee is going to double? I don't know. Um, bananas. Uh, so there's a lot of problems uh, linked with climate change that are threatening banana crops. So floods in Peru, uh, frequent heat waves in the Caribbean and Latin America, and TO4, which is a disease that threatens a very common banana, the Cavendish banana, which is a robust and tasty species of banana. So, um, finally, 
tea and chocolate. <laughs> oh no! Now, in an Irish context, this uh, this makes a big difference because uh, you know we love our tea, we love a cup of tea, and in India they're reporting more extreme flooding. Uh, a tea with tea, tea growers at tea farms, um, and at this stage, I would ask, I would usually ask, who here likes chocolate? If I was in the room with you, you know, I'm raising my hand because I really like chocolate. Uh, but um, heat waves in Africa are causing a lot of problems for uh, cocoa farmers, and cocoa is what chocolate is made of. So, yeah, it's a, uh, it is a problem. So. That fact really, really resonates with me that 80% of the world's food, which food feeds 6.5 billion people, it's, uh, you know, 80% of our population comes from 500 million family farms, you know, so half a billion farms feed 6.5 billion people. So those farms, a lot of them are in the global south around the equator, places under threat from climate change. So what happens when these farms go bust? Who knows? Won't someone please think of the chocolate? I feel, I feel you, Mr. Dog, I feel you. But in terms of food insecurity, we promote fair trade, we promote crop diversity, which is a type of technique that we use, uh, that farmers in the global south use um, to do climate smart cropping systems. So that's different crops at different, you know, different areas. So a variety of crops, not just one. We rotate the crops, which makes them, uh, you know, makes them more uh, resilient to disease and keeps the soil healthy. And uh, also planting crops in the right places and stuff like that. And also agroecology, which is something that uh, I've touched on, and uh, is also a very powerful method of fair trade. So that's uh, one thing that we do to combat food insecurity. So. To move back to the topic of who is your farmer, uh, this was a thing that we were trying to do with Fair Trade Fortnite, which is our big flagship annual event at Fair Trade. So that's two weeks worth of workshops and talks and events. So I got to bring these guys uh, around Ireland for talks and events and community visits, and it was great fun. So on the left, that man is uh, Jose Daniel Aguilar, coffee farmer from Honduras which is in Latin America. Um, and then on the right, this is um, a woman behind you, Innocent, a tea farmer from Uganda. And these are my friends who came to visit us. And the whole idea is to make people aware that, you know, where we come from our food, or where, where our food comes from, there's a human face attached to it at the other end that is, it's a family or it's, you know, people on the ground you know, picking the tea leaves or looking after the cocoa plants, the crops. And uh, so their stories are very powerful. So I'd like to finish with a case study, which is a just, this is a, a woman called Amelia Deborah from Ghana and uh, Fairtrade went to where she lives in Ghana to see about her, you know, her, her farming techniques because it was so successful. So in the past, it was very difficult for her but she was able to turn that around through training with her co-op so in 2018 her farm was not fertile she was a farming cocoa became very waterlogged logged and she struggles to make ends meet she was in debt and she struggled a lot for a time but through her co-op she joined the sankofa project um which is a project available to fair trade members which is basically a training program about equipping farmers to deal with the cost of living and climate crises head on by offering training um, in agroforestry. And so you can kind of see her farm there behind her. It's, it's just, it's thriving. So it's a small plot. So it's very important with small uh, plots of farm, you, you don't have that much space. So you need to make sure that the space you have gets used really, really well. And that's what agroforestry is all about. Um, so this increased income from her land and uh, it meant that she was able to pay off her debts. It meant that her, her farm became healthier and it's now so efficient with water and nutrient cycling that she doesn't need to hire anybody to help her. The farm is almost like it's self-sufficient. It's self so she saves even more money that way. So it's a win-win-win. And those are the kinds of outcomes we can offer to farmers in the global south 
with money that is raised from people buying fair trade products. Um, so that moves us on nicely to the next steps, which is, um, you know, buying fair trade if you can buy fair trade. And a really cool and other other example of a project that happened you kind of see there on the right was that fair trade producers across Latin America and the Caribbean uh, in 2022 in a six month tree planting drive planted 300,000 trees. Just imagine how much, like in one one generation, fifty to one hundred years, how much biodiversity and how much health, healthy ecosystem is going to be because of that. So that's the sort of thing I would I would actually love to see in Ireland. But that's another another conversation. Um, so if you guys want to take action, things you can do are choose fair trade whenever you can. You're in the supermarket with your parents, you're in the shop by yourself. Yeah, see what has the fair trade logo on it. That fair trade logo and uh, spread the word so visit us on social media and uh, on our website and stuff to get more information and if any of you guys want to do a project on fair trade for this uh, particular um, project that you guys are on uh, then we'd love to see what you can come up with and see if we can support you so um, yeah so that's, uh, that's it from me you can be part of the solution and uh, yeah I'd like to open the floor to any questions that you guys might have. So I'll stop sharing now. That was great, Aiden. Thanks, man, for that. Really interesting stuff there. And mm. yeah, like Aiden said, if you guys, if any classes have any any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat box there um, and we'll, we'll get to them when they can. I had a question about chocolate. I was a bit concerned there. Um, when you're saying, you know, by 2050, we might have uh, a serious struggle on our hands with it. And I actually don't know myself, how does um, cocoa or actually grow? What what kind of plant is it on? And what's the, the danger that it's facing? Mm. So, yeah, fair enough. And um, cocoa is a pod. Um, so it's kind of like a, it's basically it looks similar to a coconut and it's um it grows on trees so low trees and the pods kind of uh they they develop um throughout the growing season and they're soft at first and then they get hard and then you cut them down when they're kind of when they're ripe and you can kind of see the uh they're, they're the right color and then uh, kind of uh there's a lot of great videos on the fair trade international fair trade um fair trade foundation youtube channel about about cocoa because it's such a, a big kind of flagship product for us but yeah so it needs to be you know the pod needs to be opened then uh the the seeds and the inner pulp needs to be fermented and then dried out uh in the sun and that's how you get the the chocolatey flavor that everyone loves and then you add everything else to make chocolate. Mm. Thanks, Lance. Yeah. That's the same good. Um, we have a question here as well from Newtown White Educate Together. And yeah. they ask, what can one school do to support fair trade? One school. So, I mean, I suppose the, the most obvious thing is you can become a fair trade school. We have that program. So that's a... Uh, it's, Basically, it means that you have to do certain things during the year and um, meet certain criteria. And it's it's simple enough. It's kind of it's a fair trade uh, event during fair trade fortnight uh, and a fair trade awareness raising thing within the school. So that could be, you know, watching a film or having some kind of a campaign. And then uh, committing to serve fair trade tea and coffee in the staff room. And um, I, just, I think there's maybe one or two other things I can't quite remember. But yeah, we're, we're very much um, open to helping people to do that and uh, trying to encourage schools in that direction. And there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of fair trade schools um, in the countries. I think we have 40 or 50 or so, maybe more. I haven't checked in a while. But um, yeah, they're all around the country. So that's one thing you can do. And then we'll send you a certificate. Um, and then uh, also just in general, you can have uh, fair trade events 
and fair trade just if like if there's um an opportunity to in in the in the canteen to have a fair trade thing um you know fair trade products or as my teacher did way back in the day schools or classes can have a fair trade lunch or a fair trade like little uh fair trade meal breakfast or lunch then uh, you know that's that's also pretty cool because we have a lot of a lot of great products out there in the supermarkets well and i've just put a link there in the chat to um the fair trade schools if anybody wants to have mm. a look at that you can um, and i suppose a, a lot of schools here would be growing um some of their own vegetables on school grounds or even at home would you say that that's an important um, thing that schools or uh, anybody can do is to produce some of their own food yeah absolutely that's a that's a fantastic project and i do that myself uh and just down in my conservatory just there i've uh, just um just started to propagate some uh, broccoli and cauliflower and courgettes and i need to get some other stuff planted but yeah now is the kind of the time to start uh planting crops indoors so that then they can be transferred outdoors and it is it's fantastic and it brings you closer to your food because you know if you have even just a small area of space you know two by two or three by three you can actually you know if you if you stay on top of it you can produce so much food it's amazing you know like when you just you you produce the food yourself and then it tastes it tastes so much better because it's um it's all completely organic like i i feel like you haven't really tasted a tomato until you've tasted one that's just off the vine you know so yeah i'd, I'd say definitely encourage encourage that sort of thing um with schools so fair play um well another another question here what food group need fair trade the most so that's a question from alistair um sorry when you say food group uh do you mean the uh the the carbs versus roughage versus fibers versus vitamins type thing or what what exactly i wonder i wonder what types of food are the most important for us to be buying fair trade from okay. any particular vegetable right. okay i get you um yeah um so our big kind of um in Ireland, anyway, one of our one of our biggest uh, sales products in terms of sales is bananas. So, if you're in a supermarket getting bananas, always try to go with fair trade bananas. And then tea is pretty big. So, just in terms of like in terms of just purely in terms of numbers, um, it'd be bananas, a tea, coffee, chocolate, and now it's flowers. Um, is is coming up in a big way uh and yeah yeah because cho cho chocolate of course comes from the uh the, the cocoa plant and um, we do do we like we we do other products um in in the fruit and veg range but they wouldn't be kind of uh as you know as big in terms of sales so those would be kind of those would be main ones for helping but basically anything that has the fair trade label on it like we have kind of a uh, some types of uh so rice and um uh cereals that you'll see cereal products uh a lot of them kind of have fair trade what's called fair trade ingredients so fsi so that's whenever if there's one fair trade sourced ingredient then it has the fsi label and then also we have uh, fair trade kombucha has just been launched by um uh, Hearst Botanicals. So if you see a Hearst Botanicals kombucha, that's fair trade. Yeah, look out for that. Um, and uh, see other questions. Yep. So we have a question here from Peter as well, National School, and they're mm. asking where and when did fair trade start? That's a good one. That's a good question. It's a really good question. Um, so it's kind of um, it began actually in uh. It was originally after World War II, uh, you guys might have kind of covered that, but basically there was a lot of, um, there was a big demand for uh, organizations and sort of, I suppose, organizations like Oxfam 
and uh, concern were the kind of forerunners of the whole fair trade thing. So the whole idea was that after, after World War II, uh, a lot of countries in Europe and uh, in the global south were, and uh, just around the world were very, very poor. They were very struggling. So the it was originally a market tool to try to help them to sell uh, products that they had produced at home. And it was actually mostly textiles and crafts originally. The idea being to help those countries get back on their feet after uh, World War Two, And then like from then, they're kind of it, within the UK, I think was a big UK and America were kind of big um, uh, big original, uh, for, uh, I suppose, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, they were they were influential at the start um, of fair trade, and uh, then that was around the the seventies um, that that all seventies into eighties that all began to kind of like kick off. It was originally called alternative trade, and then the fair trade label came in, I think, mid eighties, and then it was incorporated in Ireland. Uh, in 1993 or four, I can't remember which, but uh, so it's been in, around in Ireland for uh, over 30 years now. So um, that's kind of uh, yeah, a bit about the, the history of fair trade. So now we have 16 countries in Europe doing fair trade. So there's fair trade Germany, fair trade UK, fair trade Ireland, um, and uh, we're all kind of working together towards the same goal. So it's 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 become uh, quite a, a powerful and a uh, large and extensive network. So. Brilliant, that's great yes. to hear, yeah. And a few more questions coming in now. A um, question from Nora. Which mm. shop or outlet is the best one in Ireland to buy fair trade produce from? Oh, um, I'm, I'm not- controversial, I, I, <laughs> I can't say that, I get into trouble, but uh, well, just say the um, the the range in Super Value is very good. Range in in Tesco, Marks and Spencer actually also uh, very good. And then we also have yeah, little little and Aldi. So yeah, a lot of the um, yeah, a lot of the large large retailers, supermarkets uh, do stock a lot of fair trade products. Um, uh, Super Value have been very good for sponsorship uh, down through the years. Um, and you know, just having having stalls and stuff. They actually at one point they had an entire fair trade separate fair trade section, mm -hmm. um, but that was deemed to be confusing. So, um, you know, because people expect you know certain products in certain places. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, it was kind of it, they, they scrapped that. But yeah, do look out for it if and when you're in a supermarket. Thanks for the question. And is that something um, helpful that schools could do is to ask their local supermarket to mm. make sure that they're stocking fair trade things? Like, is that helpful? Yes, absolutely. That's really, really helpful. Um, yeah, to have a word with you if you're in the shop or if you're in a, uh, have an opportunity to write a letter or uh, send an email or anything like that. Yeah, that's, that's really, really helpful. Really helps us. Brilliant. Okay, another question here from Sixth Class in Kilkool. They ask, what country produces the most cocoa? That's a hard one as well. I'm sure if you'll... That's a good question. Mm. I don't know is the answer. Yeah. I, I, I actually don't <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a great question. But it is a lot of um a lot of a lot of countries in in Africa and Latin America would produce a lot of these types of crops that are kind of uh, grown in pods. Um you know the likes of cocoa and uh, and coconuts and uh, mangoes and stuff like that because of you know the temperatures. So, but yeah, uh, the answer is I don't know. I can. That'll yeah, be a project I, I, for I, them to find out themselves. Maybe yeah, they'll, they'll yeah, have fun to project. Look that up. Mm. Um, but we've got um, another couple of. We just take maybe two more um, mm. before we wrap up. Um, so St. Patrick's Boys National School in Donegal asks, can we prove that Ireland is playing its part and helping? So I'm not sure if that means Irish government or Ireland in general. Mm. Any thoughts on that, Aidan? Yeah, it's a really good, um, really good approach, really good way to be thinking about things because, um, yeah, oftentimes, uh, oftentimes promises are made or commitments are made and they're not kept, you know. Um, and the answer is that, well, in terms of the fair trade network, yes, we do do 
our part. So we're kind of um, Ireland is a, a much smaller fair trade organisation than than a lot of other ones. You know, we only have five staff, uh, whereas uh, you know other ones like you know UK Germany they would have you know 20, 30, 40 staff. But um, yeah, in terms of in terms of fair trade international, we do meet you know all of our obligations, um, and we're also kind of we are engaging in a big a proposal with Fair Trade International at the moment called EC Deer, which is development education awareness raising. So, you know, there'll be more on that when it, uh, when, if and when it comes to fruition. But um, in terms of Ireland in general, uh, in, in general doing its part, uh, we, the thing is, uh, whoever asked that question, it's, uh, it's a really good thing because in Ireland, what I've seen is that loads of communities like us people in schools, people in local communities, people planting trees, we're doing huge amounts of work. Whereas it's just like, you know, from the top level, our forestry model is all wrong. Our farming model is very damaging to biodiversity. And so like, you know, from the top level, we governments, Green Party um, and different, you know, th there's been kind of uh, commitments made that haven't, you know, towards me not meeting are towards um hitting our emissions targets you know reducing our emissions that uh that aren't aren't in, there, there isn't really a, a good enough plan in place to actually meet those targets so yeah i would say kind of coming out of that question it's kind of like our job as citizens to you know ensure that you know our local representatives are actually you know representing our interests and you know so that means email your td write letters and you know Actually, a very, very powerful thing is having conversations, just having conversations with people, with your friends, with your family, you know, don't shy away from it you know, because it is like biodiversity, climate crisis, climate change. These are all very important things, but, you know, I feel like we don't talk about them enough. Brilliant. That's brilliant. Just we just two more left. So we'll, uh, they're quickish ones. So we'll go through yeah, those. Yeah. So from Bogor Lahan National School, they're asking, what is the most popular fair trade product? Um, that varies year on year, but I think it is very consistently bananas uh, up there. Uh, coffee had gone past bananas in recent years, but now but then it went down due to COVID, and now it's kind of you know coming back up. And tea is pretty pretty solid uh, throughout. So yeah, do look out for these products when you're in the supermarket. Real, and then last question. Um, is how long have you been working with fair trade? Me, I've been working since October, so not very long. About whatever that is, six or seven months, but I like it. <laughs> Brilliant. That's great, Aidan. That's I think we'll we'll leave it at that for today. We're just getting to the end of our time. Yeah. Um, so thanks to everybody for coming along and for loads of really great questions. And um, it's great to see the, the interest is there. And if people do want to learn more, I'm sure they can find out lots on the Fair Trade website. And mm. so that there's lots of different videos and, and links and things there. And um, so I just want to say a yeah, massive thanks to Aidan for um, giving us that really interesting presentation and answering all the questions um, mm. with us today. And um, hope everyone enjoyed it um, and make sure you are. Um, come along to some of our other events this week and check out our Green Schools website to find out more. Um, and this recording will be online on our event page afterwards so you can share it with other classes in your school um, if you like. So yeah, thanks again to everybody. Hope you get some time outside in the sunshine today. Um, and big thanks to, to Aiden again. Thanks a lot for the questions, guys.